what is concurrency control? It's a way to ensure that uh, transactions follow the rules that um, we talked about and guarantee serializability or at least one of the weaker levels, depending on what you want. So the basic concurrency control mechanism, the first ones to be implemented were lock-based protocols. What are lock-based protocols? You get a lock on a data item. Nobody else can get a lock on the data item. What is a protocol? The protocol is a set of rules which everybody should follow. So in this case, the rule that is followed is you cannot read a data item until you've got a lock on it. You cannot write a data item until you've got a lock on it. In fact, databases have two kinds of locks, a read lock and a write lock, or it's a read lock is also called shared lock, because multiple people can get a shared lock on the same data item. And an exclusive lock, which says only one person can get an exclusive lock. And when you have an exclusive lock, nobody can have a shared lock. So the protocol is that you have to get a shared lock before you read, an exclusive lock before you write. That's a minimum. When you release the lock, well, it depends on the protocol. And depending on how you do this, you might get serializability or you might get read committed and so on. You can get the other levels based on the particular protocol you use. So uh, this talks about the two modes, exclusive mode and shared mode for locks. Now there is some underlying uh, system, the lock manager, which manages the locks. The lock manager will ensure that uh, no two thing transaction can get conflicting locks at the same time. But it does not ensure the rest of the protocol. All it manages is the lock. You ask for a lock, it will ensure that when it says you got the lock, nobody else can have a conflicting lock. If you ask for a shared lock, others may have the shared lock, but not an exclusive lock. If you ask for an exclusive lock, when you get it, nobody else can have any lock. Only you have it. That's what the lock manager, or the concurrency, con uh, uh, well, the underlying lock manager guarantees only this much. The concurrency control manager might do something more. Uh, so here's a lock compatibility matrix. Shared and shared is true, meaning they can, uh, two people can have, two transactions can have shared locks on the same item at the same time. The other three entries are false, meaning if somebody has an exclusive lock, nobody else can have a shared lock at the same time, and, or an exclusive lock at the same time. Now this uh, matrix is symmetric. The order is irrelevant, meaning we don't care whether the X lock came first or the S lock came first. All we are saying is they cannot coexist. Maybe that the S lock request came first, it was granted, then the X lock request has to wait. Or it, maybe the X lock request came first, it was granted, then the S lock has to wait. So the ordering is irrelevant. All it says is they cannot both be granted uh, at the same time on the same object. So basically, if somebody else has a lock, you wait. Now what can happen when you have waiting? You can have deadlocks, a cyclic wait, and the concurrency control manager, lock manager, one of its other jobs is to detect that there is a cycle of locks and then do something about it. So what do you do? If transactions have got locks, and now there's a cyclic waiting. A is waiting for B, B is waiting for C, C is waiting for A. What to do now? It's a deadlock. How do you resolve a deadlock? You have to release locks. How do you release a lock? You roll back a transaction. Okay. So the good thing is transactions always be rolled back. The database makes no guarantee it will commit it until you have said commit and the database says I'm done. Until that point, at any point, the database can unilaterally say I've rolled you this transaction back. And the application has to deal with it. The application is told, sorry, you're rolled back. What to do now, that, that's up to the application. It can retry or it can tell the user, sorry, your transaction failed. So that's uh, deadlock. I'm going to, uh, yeah, there's some other stuff on starvation and so on. I'm going to skip that. And now we'll come to the two-phase locking protocol. It's a protocol because it's a set of rules which are followed. And the two-phase locking protocol, the rules it follows, the first part is that you can only read when you have a lock. You can only write when you have a lock. That's common. Um, now, un unless you're doing the uh, uncommitted read, the lowest level you can read without a lock even. So let's leave that out. For the other levels, you have to follow these. 
Now, if you just do this, to read, you get an S lock, to write, you get an X lock. When you finish reading, you release the lock. When you finish writing, you release the lock. What can go wrong? You can have a transaction which read a value, got a lock, read a value, released the lock. Another transaction comes, gets an X lock, updates the value, releases the lock. It commits also. It commits even maybe. That's OK. Now this guy again comes and gets the S lock and then uh, uh, reads the same value and now it is seeing a different value. Is this serializable? It's not. It's all two different values. It cannot happen in a serial schedule. In a serial schedule, nothing else is happening. How can it see two different values? Unless it only did the update. Okay, so this is not serializable. And the problem is that you release locks too early. You release the shared lock early. So one possible protocol is that you hold all locks to end of transaction. Once you get a lock, you never release it. And practically speaking, that's what systems do. And practically speaking, people say two-phase locking, uh, you know, databases do two-phase locking. What they mean is that you get the lock and hold it till the end. But the actual two-phase locking protocol does not insist that the locks be held to the end. So the basic two-phase locking protocol says that following. That there is a growing phase where transactions may obtain locks but cannot release anything. And then there's a shrinking phase where transactions may release locks but may not obtain any new lock. That's all the protocol says. And this is a minimum requirement for serialization. If you follow this rule, you will get serializability. Turns out you will not get recoverability because it doesn't say anything about committing. So if you release an X lock somewhere in phase two, before you committed, somebody can read the value which you wrote. So that's a bad idea. So practically speaking, you must at least hold exclusive locks until you commit. Okay? So that version of two-phase locking is uh, sometimes called strict two-phase locking. Strict because the exclusive locks are held to the end. And this is the minimum that any database has to support. This is just a theoretical concept. Nobody actually implements uh, the simplest version of this. So you have these rules, and then you have one more rule, which is exclusive lock must be held to the end. That is the minimum which anyone supports. But in fact, what most databases support is even shared locks are held till the end, till commit. And that version of two-phase locking is called rigorous two-phase locking. Now, as I said, if you go to the industry, they say two-phase locking. It's inevitably databases actually never release locks early. In fact, they don't, unless you, you know, they, they do allow, uh, they, they do have a command for releasing locks, but if you don't say anything, the locks are released only by the commit instruction. Till then, it will never release a lock by itself. So that rigorous two-phase locking is what is actually implemented. But this is the minimum requirement, and a lot of theoretical work says that if you satisfy this minimum, certain other properties are true. In particular, serializability is guaranteed by this. So a lot of the results, are, you, you want to make the minimum assumption. If this minimum is satisfied, if I can prove a property, that's better than saying, oh, you must also hold locks till the end, only then this property is satisfied. So theoreticians like to minimize the assumptions, ensure that under this minimal assumption, something holds. So theoretically, this is important. Practically, rigorous two-phase locking is this one. Rigorous two-phase locking is what is implemented. I'm going to skip uh, a lot of details about lock conversion. You can always go from an S-lock to an X-lock. You can downgrade from an X-lock to an S-lock, um, but um, that is usually not done, but it can be done as part of two-phase locking. I'll skip the details for lack of time. It's tough on the lock manager. In the main course, I'll cover all this. Deadlock prevention, deadlock detection, um, and then a whole bunch of other stuff, multi-granularity locking, timestamp-based time protocols. So the main thing, I'll talk about all this. And validation-based protocols, multi-version schemes, snapshot isolation. There's a lot of stuff here. Okay? So in the main course, I won't cover all of this in great detail, but I'm going to at least expose 
people to what are these ideas. In the book, these are covered in a lot more detail. I don't really expect a first database course to cover all these things. When we do the course here, I don't have time by the end of the course to do all of this in detail. So I expose people to the concepts and that's about it. Locking is the only thing which I cover in some detail. Beyond that, I just expose them to the ideas. Uh, and in the spirit of exposing people to ideas, I just want to mention snapshot isolation. Because practically speaking, this is widely used and it's pretty useful actually. So it is a concurrency control protocol, which is different from plain locking. It's a, a member of uh, this class of protocols called multi-version schemes. What is a multi-version scheme? So normally you say there is a value. When it's updated, it gets a new value. The old value is forgotten. In a multi-version scheme, you not only keep the new value, you keep the old value also. And there's something nice conceptually about this. Right? If you are running a company, maybe you should keep the history of what happened. But that's not the goal here. So the goal here is to keep old values around to help improve concurrency of transactions. So let's take the simplest case of snapshot isolation. Supposing I have a database in a particular state. And when the transaction starts, I click a snapshot of the database. And now any read which the transaction does, you give the value as of this snapshot. Meanwhile, what can happen? Other transactions can come, update the database, and so forth. But in the snapshot I clicked, nothing has changed. It's frozen. So that does not, clicking a snapshot does not affect the database in any way. But what is the benefit it gives? For a transaction which is just reading the database, it is going to see values as of a particular point in time. It does not need to get locks. It does not need to trouble other transactions. It gets a quick snapshot, and then it can take its time to read the snapshot. So it's a very attractive idea. How do you physically implement a snapshot? You can't go physically click a snapshot of a database. So what do you do? The idea is you use multiple versions. So whenever anybody updates a data item, they will keep the old version. But you keep some count of time. When did the version change? At what time? When a transaction comes and takes a snapshot, you take the time of the snapshot. So now when you read a data item, you will see what is the correct version as of that time. Okay. So what is important is when a transaction commits, you need a time associated with when the transaction committed. So if you get a snapshot before that time, you'll see the some earlier value. If you have a snapshot after that time, you will see that value or a later value. Is this clear? That is conceptually what snapshot isolation is. But of course, there are details. Um, so snapshot isolation is fantastic if you use it for read-only transactions. It doesn't affect serializability. It doesn't affect anything. And it gives you very good performance. The problem is that people used it for uh, even when there are updates. It's actually possible to use two-phase locking for updates. And read-only transactions get a snapshot and work off the snapshot. That is actually a nice protocol. And there are database systems which support this protocol. However, what systems like Oracle and PostgreSQL did is they hacked up the snapshot isolation protocol by adding some checks. They don't do full locking. They do some, some vague kind of locking. I won't get into the details. And they call this the snapshot isolation protocol. And update transactions followed this protocol. And what happens with that is that you don't get serializability. You can have a result which is not serializable. And as an example of that, so what does the protocol do? Um, essentially, if you have two transactions, T1 and T2, which are concurrent. So this is running. This is also running at the same time. If there were serial, one was running. After it finished, the next one started, no problem. If they're concurrent like this, if both of, if this writes A and this also writes A, then one of them will be rolled back. 
let's say the second one. This will not be allowed to commit. That's a check which uh, snapshot isolation does. Transactions get a snapshot. They read values from their snapshot. And if they write a data item and another concurrent transaction writes the same data item, one of them is rolled back. That's the intuition of snapshot isolation protocol. Uh, the problem with that protocol is it allows something like this. Read A and take that value uh, and write it to B. Okay? Write that value into B. And another guy reads B and copies that value into A. Now take these two transactions. This is copying the value from A to B. This is copying the value from B to A. If they run serially, what can happen? If this runs first and then this, what will happen? First of all, A is copied to B. So both A and B are the same value after this, which is the initial value of A. And what does this do? It's copying B to A, which is actually having no effect because they are already the same, with the initial value of A. On the other hand, if T2 ran first and then T1, what will happen? B is copied to A, and then T1 has no effect because it's copying, but the final state is B. So in any sequential execution of these two, um, both the things will have the same value. But in snapshot isolation, if they run concurrently, what can happen? This reads A, this reads B from a snapshot. Then this writes B, this writes A. What is the net result? Swap. The two have been swapped. Because you read this, you read that, that is copied here, this is copied there. So in snapshot isolation, the swap can happen. And it's not prevented. Why is it not prevented? They wrote different data items. They didn't write the same data item. Snapshot isolation allows it. So this is a problem with snapshot isolation. And this can lead to other issues. So why did Oracle go ahead and implement it, uh, even though it, it's not serializable? This was a small example showing that it's not serializable. It turns out that most of the time it doesn't matter. And people don't notice it. And Oracle did it because most people don't notice it. And uh, academicians like Alan Fekete were worried about well, what is going on. How can Oracle do this? Don't people run into problems? So they said, how do we see this? Let's take some sample application and see if it can cause problems. So they took one such sample application, which is a widely used benchmark, and they analyzed it. And they showed that that particular benchmark, even if you run it under snapshot isolation, all the executions are serializable. And why? Because when there are no transactions like this in that benchmark, which do the swap. Okay. Uh, there are other funny cases which can happen. And then they said that maybe this is why people are getting away with it. Maybe most common situations, this does not happen. But that's not the same as saying it cannot happen. In fact, it happened in IIT Bombay. We had a system which TCS developed using Oracle. It seemed to be running fine. Uh, till, I mean, it had other problems, many other problems. But anyway, uh, one day, the financial auditors came and said, look, you have two different bills which have the same number. Okay, this is a financial bill. And two bills having the same number can be taken as evidence of fraud. Why is it evidence of fraud? Let's say you collected money from two people and gave them the same receipt number. So they think they have, uh, it's been recorded. In your system, you keep one of them and throw away the other. Okay? But if you somehow left trails of the two receipts with the same number, maybe you pocketed money. Okay? That's the job of financial auditors, to find such things. And they found this had happened. So what's going on? You know, clearly, the bill numbers were generated by the database and the application, not by humans. We presume that the database application was not trying to commit fraud. How did this happen? Eventually, we traced it down to snapshot isolation. Okay. So it turned out that there were some unusual properties of the application, which were necessitated by how things are done. IIT had a slightly different way of doing things than other places, which the application implemented. And this, unfortunately, had failed under snapshot isolation. 
They said other engineers from uh, TCS who built this, are they fools? I said, no, they're actually very smart people, pretty smart. They had, uh, in fact, I think they had, uh, you know, there's, there's this history which gets passed down within these organizations. So somebody would have told them, look, when you do things in Oracle, you could run into this problem. Here is one way you can try to fix it. So we found in that code when we were looking at it that they had tried various tricks there. It was there in the code. But none of it worked because the tricks that they had been told were not the correct solutions. Somehow that message didn't got garbled in transmission through TCS and they didn't know exactly how to correct it. They did something wrong and that's how this happened. So the moral of the story is sometimes you need to understand what the hell is going on behind the scenes. You cannot assume that everything is clean underneath. So then what did we do? There is a way workaround. Um, there is something uh, for update annotation, which Oracle supports. Oracle also realized that there may be situations where people will run into trouble. So they provided this syntax to work around it. So we could add that and we could eventually work around. Um, and we fixed that. But this led to research. So we said, can we look at an application and judge whether it can cause trouble uh, with snapshot isolation or is it safe? What the earlier work of Fekete and all was, this particular application is safe. We said, can we build a tool which automates this? And so we had an MTech student, and Alan was also involved in this. Uh, so uh, we, we, this MTech student built a tool. This was his MTech thesis. Build a tool which can analyze an application and say, can it run into trouble under snapshot isolation? So uh, that got published in one of the leading conferences. So th this is the kind of thing which uh, good research is about. You find a real problem, and you can solve it in one of two ways. So at that point, our solution was we'll analyze the application and see if it can get into problems and then add the four update statements and clean up. But there is another thing which we could have done, we didn't do. Alan went back and did it with his PhD student, which is, can you modify PostgreSQL's snapshot isolation to avoid the problem in the first place? So that eventually got implemented in PostgreSQL, which is actually a nicer solution because it, it's more general. And it still gives the performance benefits of snapshot isolation. So that's a nice piece of work. So I'll stop there.